Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, welcome to this lesson. In this lesson, we are going to learn about an important upper respiratory tract infection, which is quite common in children and it is one of the serious diseases leading to more of a morbidity mortality in the childhood. Coming to the lesson objectives, we are going to learn about the upper respiratory tract infections and the bacteria which cause patch in the throat and also we will learn an approach to the laboratory diagnosis when we come across patch in the throat. The contents of this lesson will be discussed under the following headings. We will learn about the disease in detail, its definition, epidemiology, prevention, complications and treatment and also the bacteria which cause this kind of a infection, their morphology, structural and physiological characteristics and the pathogenesis of the infection. We will also learn about how do we approach such a patient for prompt and specific laboratory diagnosis so that we can help the patient recover faster. Again let us take an example of a case we had in April 2017. This was a school going child 5 year old Miss Usha. She was brought to the hospital in a toxic state. She was not vaccinated properly rather some doses were missed. She lived in a crowded place and she was a malnourished child. She started having the whole episode, it started with a sore throat and few days later she went into toxemia, she was having high grade fever, severe throat pain and she was unable to swallow even a sip of water. About few hours back she was brought to the hospital, she also had a difficulty in breathing. When she was brought to the hospital, on examination we found that she had high grade fever and on throat examination using the tongue depressor, we could observe a patch in the throat which was leathery in nature and it was kind of a necrotic patch what we could see with the highly inflamed surrounding pharyngeal tissues. And also her neck was swollen, these were the two important findings on examination. With this history, we diagnosed case of diphtheria. However, before making such a diagnosis, it is important to keep in our mind that there are various other organisms which can cause patch in the throat, especially the streptococcus pyogenes which can cause the tonsillitis and granular pharyngitis which can also similarly mimic patch in the throat. Another important infection what we can think about is the Vincent's angina which is caused by anaerobic as well as the spirochete uh, organisms which is another important differential diagnosis. Another uh, infection we can keep in mind is the infectious mononucleosis and candidiasis is yet another common infection which could also be mimicking the similar condition as we saw in Ms. Usha. The clinical diagnosis was made however, laboratory confirmation is quite important. What is diphtheria? Diphtheria is an infectious disease mostly of the childhood caused by Corini bacterium diphtheriae. It is associated with high morbidity and mortality. Clinically, this disease presents as fever, toxemia, a tough leathery patch in the throat which usually can be a reason for choking, respiratory obstruction sometimes leading to fatality. This is a severe deadly disease of childhood. In this case, our diagnosis was more in favor of diphtheria mainly because of high fever, toxemia, pseudomembrane what we saw the patch and there was difficulty in swallowing and breathing and in addition she had bull's neck which is very typical of 
diphtheria which is because of cervical lymphadenitis. That is why this diagnosis was mainly going in favor of diphtheria. However, uh, etiological diagnosis and confirmation of clinical diagnosis is very important. Thus, laboratory diagnosis plays a very important role in this case. Although the treatment should not be held up because the, the child was brought in a toxic state and she needed immediate attention and therapy. Therapy was already started, antibiotics were given. However, we try to work on war foot basis in this case. The clinician was asked to send the swab from that area. Immediately it was transported and we did the, the workup in the laboratory. Although the diagnosis of diphtheria is mainly clinical, laboratory diagnosis is very important as I said to confirm etiological diagnosis, the bacteria involved and also for initiating control and preventive measures against the disease diagnosed. So, what we did in the lab is we started working up with a case, choosing right specimen is important. We do not want any sample which is collected away from the, the patch which is really present there. So, choosing the right specimen is important here, collecting is also important. We actually while collecting, it looks uh, that the patch can be easily removed. So, there is a temptation to peel off the patch, but we should never do it, never try to attempt peeling the patch because that could result into severe hemorrhage, it can cause respiratory choking etcetera which could be very dangerous. The specimen was transferred to the laboratory and we instructed that the swab should not be frozen. In the next 15 minutes, what we did was smear was prepared, the important stainings which are available to us and commonly done are the gram staining and the Albert stain. Both were done and the slides were subjected to microscopy. Under microscope, we could see the typical gram positive bacilli with clubbed ends. These are mainly because the bacteria have got metachromatic granule which are arranged at either ends. Another important uh, peculiar arrangement we are seeing here, this is the V form we are appreciating and there are other forms as well, some are X shaped, some are L shaped. This is mainly because of the particular pattern of division which I will come to it. Here we saw the club shaped organisms having metachromatic granules and this particular arrangement of Chinese letter form is very typical of Cornibacterium diphtheriae. One more important thing here is that we should be able to differentiate these organisms from the commensals which are called as the diphtheroids. The diphtheroids are the commensals which are present on the skin as well as in the throat and they need to be really differentiated from the pathogenic ones. How do we differentiate that is basically these uh, diphtheroids have got pointed ends, they are shorter than the Cornibacteriae and they are in palisading arrangement. That arrangement really makes the difference in identifying the pathogenic from the commensal diphtheroids. Another staining as I said is Albert stain. In Albert stain, typical Chinese letter pattern arrangement was again confirmed. You could see here one of them L and B forms. This is mainly because the arrangement typically is seen because of a particular type of division these organisms are going to follow when they are having binary fission. This is called as a snapping cell division wherein the cells will divide horizontally and they fail to separate from each other and they remain attached at acute angles to one another which results into formation of the cuneiform or Chinese letter arrangement. So, these two findings were very, very important for us and they directly give us the clue that this could be a case of diphtheria. What we did was immediately the physician was called within 15 minutes and he was informed to start the antitoxin which was done so along with the antibiotic. Now, the task in front of us is to grow this bacterium and prove its toxigenicity. As I said that these could be just the bystanders or they may be just the commensals. So, how do we prove that is by uh, subjecting the sample for culture, the isolation, identification and the toxigenicity testing which we started with in the laboratory. Choosing the right media is important, the time is very crucial in such cases. So, what we did was 
important non selective and the enriched medium which is available for growing cornibacterium diphtheriae is the Loeffler serum slope. This medium contains serum as the enrichment and as cornibacterium diphtheriae is the fastidious organism, it needs to be grown on any medium which contains blood serum. This medium is particularly chosen because the growth we are going to find in this medium is faster that is within 6 to 12 hours we should be able to find few colonies of cornibacterium which again helps in management of the patient. Another few media what we chose is potassium telluride blood agar in short called as PTA. This medium contains 0 0.04 percent potassium telluride. This particular agent acts as a selective agent in this medium. It is nothing but blood agar added with this compound potassium telluride. This is a selective medium because the sample is coming from the throat. We expect commensals to be present. In such cases, how do we isolate the pathogen is by inhibiting the others so that selective agent selectively allows the growth of corini bacteria only. Another one what we chose was a sheep blood agar again to support if there were some other organisms. So, on the next day after 18 hours what we saw was there were few colonies of cornibacteria like growth which were confirmed by making a smear and staining by grams as well as alberts. Especially this medium is used to demonstrate the metachromatic granules because there will be enriched growth of this organism. It will be able to grow luxuriantly and we will be able to demonstrate the metachromatic granules. So, what we did see on the other media are the black colored colonies on potassium telluride agar. Why this black colored colonies are produced is mainly because this one of the few organisms which can reduce the potassium telluride to metallic tellurium which gives the black color and a metallic sheen to the colonies. This is usually going to be very obvious after 24 hours. However, we could see the smaller version at the end of 18 hours. On blood agar, we grew tiny translucent colonies, non hemolytic type. Again, these two colonies were taken, they were made smear and confirmed that they are gram positive, club shaped, arranged in a typical pattern. After doing this, we are to confirm them by doing biochemical test, otherwise, we will not be able to differentiate them from other commensals which may be mimicking such a bacteria. Urease test was done which was negative and it is supposed to be negative by corny bacteria. His serum sugars are used, this organism is a fastidious one, the regular sugars will not be able to support the growth, his serum sugars were used and this organism is known to ferment glucose and it also ferments galactose and dextrin. Another sugar which will help us differentiate from others is that it does not ferment lactose, we can see there is no color change and it is also not able to ferment mannitol and sucrose. So, those were few of the biochemical tests which will help us to again focus on the diagnosis of corini bacterium. Now, we are left with important test that is to, to know whether this is a toxin producing strain. That is the reason we do this toxigenicity testing. It can be done in vivo or in vitro. In vivo we use guinea pig in which the culture is inoculated subcutaneously or intradermally and we look for changes. If it is positive it indicates the toxin producing strain of corinibacterium. Coming to the in vitro test, one of the important test is the LX gel precipitation test. What is done in this test? We take horse uh, serum agar which is incorporated with 10 percent of antitoxin and we streak test strain and the control non toxigenic strain and filter paper soaked in the antitoxin is placed on that and we incubate it for 18 to 24 hours. At the end of that what we see is if the organism is a toxin producing one, it releases the toxin in the medium, antitoxin which is going to be released through this filter paper, there is a line of band formation because the toxin and antitoxin are going to meet with each other forming the bands as we could see here. So, this test was positive in this case. There are some other in vitro tests, the tissue culture tests are there wherein bacteria they are grown on the cell lines and the 
toxin is going to have the cytotoxicity effect on the cells which could be observed under microscope at the end of 18 to 24 hours. Uh, other tests which are available rapid tests are the ELISA and the PCR. PCR especially is done to know whether the bacteria contain tox gene. These tests are very important to prove that this is a toxigenic strain and it could be the real pathogen in a given case. So, in this case final identification was done after doing the toxigenicity testing and we sent the report that toxigenic strain of Cornibacterium diphtheriae isolated by taking help of these particular tests. The patient was already on erythromycin and the other drugs which could be used in this case are the azithromycin, penicillin G, clindamycin, rifampicin, etc. After working up with this patient, we were happy that we could save the girl out of complications because immediate microscopy help us, it gave us a clue that it could be Corinibacterium and also by doing the toxigenicity uh, testing, we could prove that it is Corinibacterium diphtheriae. Girl was saved of following complications which are common in 20 percent of the cases especially the myocarditis. Why myocarditis occurs here commonly is because of a very potent toxin released by this organism which is cardiogenic type of toxin and a neurotoxin. Because it is a neurotoxin it could also have produced cranial and peripheral nerve palsies and also the child has been saved from asphyxia which is one of the cause of death again in such cases. So, by going through and working up with this case, we have already learnt about few contents of this class. We are left with studying the epidemiology, pathogenesis of the organism and prevention. So, let us deal with them in this part of the class. What is the epidemiology of diphtheria? Cases actually were very rampant in the pre-vaccination era. The vaccination started as early in 1923 onwards. Soon as the vaccine was included in the universal immunization program in most of the countries, especially in the developed countries, the disease was very much under control and there were almost no cases seen. However, in the developing countries due to especially the incomplete immunization as high as about 5000 cases worldwide per year and especially the disease is common in the Asian and sub-Saharan African area. In India, it is particularly common in some states of Bihar, Kerala, UP and Haryana. The source of infection is especially patient. The good news is that not all Cornibacterium diphtheriae are toxigenic unless they are infected by a lysogenic bacteriophage. The ones which are infected or attacked by lysogenic bacteriophage are only capable of releasing the toxin and that is how they will be highly virulent or pathogenic strains. That is the reason that usually a carrier may not be able to transmit the disease. The transmission occurs through direct patient to a healthy contact or droplet aerosols, droplet nuclei etcetera. Cornibacterium diphtheriae can also produce a milder disease that is the cutaneous diphtheria which is restricted only to the skin we see here a very typical chronic ulcers are going to be produced. There is another important species of Cornibacterium in the recent times is the Cornibacterium JKM. This organism can cause severe infections in the immunocompromised patient especially it has uh, taken uh, upper hand after we have come across with the AIDS pandemic. This is another important organism we need to keep in mind it could also produce septicemia and fatal infections in the immunocompromised patients. There are certain predisposing factors for this disease especially the main reason here are incomplete vaccination. Another few reasons are the malnutrition, overcrowding and poor hygiene. Cornibacterium diphtheriae may have different biotypes. There are three important varieties, fourth one is added here. The Cornibacterium gravis which is supposed to be causing severe infections, Cornibacterium mitis and intermediates in the in that order. Belfanti is another one which is added to this group. Coming to the pathogenesis, actually we may not find a lot of organisms as we have seen in many cases that we may even fail to demonstrate patch in the throat. 
Why this happens even if the patient is severely ill? It is basically because even if there are few organisms, they produce a highly potent toxin and this toxins absorbs very quickly into the systemic circulation immediately having action on the myocardium and the neurons. That is the reason the pathogenesis is basically dependent upon Cornibacterium strains which are infected by lysogenic bacteriophage as I already said. Powerful axotoxin is one of the most important virulence factor and this is the toxin structure what we are seeing here. It has got two components A and B. A is the active domain, B is the binding domain. B helps A to bind to epithelial cells and it helps A to get into the cells. Once A enters into cells, what it does is it prevents protein synthesis of that cell thus resulting in necrosis and death of host cell. How it prevents protein synthesis is in, in that stage ribosylation of elongation factor is prevented and there is no protein synthesis thus leading to the cell death. That is pathogenesis of this infection. Coming to how do we protect ourselves? There are vaccines which are available from long time, the DPT vaccine, all the newborns are given dose of diphtheria pertussis tetanus from 6, 10 and 14 weeks and the booster doses are also very important in endemic areas, dose can be increased, it could be given up to 12 years, usually at the 18 to 24 months and 5 years is the regular schedule, but we could also give two more doses at 8 and 12 years of age also to control the disease. It has almost come to the decline, but there are to eradicate few of the remaining cases, we could adopt the measure of increasing the, the booster doses. We know that if in any given person, the protective titer is above 0.01 unit per ml, that means he is, he can actually be called as an immunized person and he is less likely, likely to suffer from diphtheria. So, we have covered till now uh, almost all points about contents in my class. But coming to summarize, we have seen a case with throat pain, fever, bull's neck, toxemia, difficulty to eat and to breathe. This was a case of diphtheria. Diphtheria is a highly dangerous, potentially lethal disease of children few more points about this organism which is a very peculiar gram positive bacillus, fastidious in nature, catalase positive, produces black colored colonies on potassium telluride agar, urease negative and it is arranged in typically cuneiform or Chinese letter pattern having metachromatic granules. These are some of the important points you need to remember about this organism and the disease, so that all these the knowledge about the organism and the disease will help you having right approach for the diagnosis and timely management of the patients. I think we have covered and attained objectives of this class. Thank you.